Happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, Elevate. Good. It is such a blessing to be up here. Before we begin, we are just going to introduce ourselves. So my name is Zoya Thompson. I am a counselor in the area, working at an advocacy center. Um, something that I love about my job is that I am able to help kids who have gone through traumatic events and their families as well to help them on their journey towards healing. My name is Danae Sanji. I work at 88.3 The Journey, and I love anything that has to do with being outside. I love the mountains. I have a nine-month-old daughter and almost an 11-year-old son, and I am very blessed to be here. Please bow your heads as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, dear Lord. We are asking you for your Holy Spirit to come in this midst. Dear Lord, through that beautiful song service, the words of holy, 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 were in basically every song. Dear Lord, as we ponder on those words and as we go through this discussion, we dare not open up your scripture or open up a discussion without your Holy Spirit leading and illuminating our paths. Dear Father, thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit. In your name I pray, amen. So we are going to start off a little bit with a question. And it, it's more of a question I want you to ask yourself because I feel like it could be a rabbit hole. But so this is based on Steps to Christ chapter 12, by the way. Um, there's an Ellen White app on your phone if you want to follow along with some of those quotes. So the first question is this. Is doubt a sin? Is doubt a sin? What do you think? This was definitely a heavy question for me, um, but this chapter is so beautiful. And one of the things that I took from it in my quest to find is doubt a sin or not is that we are finite and God is infinite, right? So our minds cannot fully comprehend what's in God's word or who God is, um, but we have hope. Yes. And that hope is that he has given us faith. He has given us the Holy Spirit to help us with um, decrease and challenge our doubt. That's right. There's a couple of verses that was brought up um, in Steps to Christ, Romans 11, 33, and it says, oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge and how impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his way. So basically it just lays it out right there. We're not going to understand and we need to be okay with that. Um, I, there's a joke in my household. If my husband doesn't understand, he says it doesn't exist. And, I, and I'm like, well, if you don't understand women, I mean, we exist. So I'm not sure which, where you're going there. But um, we're not supposed to understand God completely or else he would cease to be God, right? So uh, the other verse is Psalm 97 verse 12. And that one is more talking about his creation. I'll just tell you what it is. His, he's, he's surrounded in clouds of darkness. Mm -hmm. um, and we, because we can't comprehend him. And in some ways that's comforting because I'd rather him know more than I know. That's for sure. Um, the last point says, God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence upon, upon which to base, base our faith. Right. Um, and God is a God who is same yesterday, today, and forever. And from the beginning of time, he gave us the ability to choose. And with doubt, we have a choice. God doesn't want us to be um, perfect robots who choose him without having a say. So even inside our Christian walk or even before our Christian walk, he has established the ability for us to choose. Right. So we can e either um, allow him to illuminate our path and where we can increase in understanding of his word. Word, or we have the ability to not and to challenge that um, in his word. And I don't think that God is unopen to us expressing our doubts. I think we'll get into that a little bit more. So now we're going to go to the next kind of question. And by the way, um, this thing is super cool. If you have a comment or if you have a, a question or an answer, if you want to contribute, um, I would encourage you to, you know, raise your hand. I can't see very well, but we're going to be taking, this is going to be taken around. So I would love to hear from you as well. 
So we're going to talk about some very important people who really did experience doubt, and it really kind of opened up my mind to not feel so bad about struggling myself. When you read the Bible, you're, you're like, oh, there's somebody just like me that struggles. This is, this is great. I don't feel alone. Did those who literally walked, like I'm saying like right next to you, like Jesus was as close to Peter, James, and John, and all of his disciples, they could touch him. He was right there, and they experienced doubt. What? So there is a quote here. It's from uh, page 111, if you're following along. There is an evidence that is open to everybody the most highly educated person, the most illiterate person, and it is the evidence of experience. Nobody can argue what you've been through. Nobody can argue with a testimony. And so that is our greatest, um, I feel, weapon against doubt. So can you talk to us about Moses? Yes. So as I was searching, Moses came to mind. And in Exodus chapter 33, um, before this, let me just preface, preface this and set the scene. Um, Moses and the Israelites, they have seen the 10 plagues. They have seen the parting of the Red Sea. They have seen the cloud that is guiding them um, and, and the wall of fire. Um, Moses talks to God like he's talking to a friend. Um, Moses also has the covenant that was given to his forefathers. And God tells him again in Exodus 33 that I am going to send an angel before you to drive out the enemies into the promised land. And you would think that would be enough. And later on, Moses says, who are you going to send with me to the promised land? Um, and God says, you are a sinful people. I cannot go with you. I will destroy you. <laughs> and it continues on to say, and Moses presses in and challenges God. And he said, how will they even know that I'm different? How will we be marked as your people if you are not with us? It will be better for us to stay inside this land with your presence than to go into a new land without your presence being there. Because God is really the difference maker um, between us and everyone else. So Moses is having this conversation with God and is insisting that, yes, you have promised me these things, but I still want more. At the end of the chapter, Moses says, you called me your own, you called me your friend, you said that you know me, I want to experience you fully. And God says, you cannot, you are a human, and if you see me, you will actually die, right? But, Moses, but God allows Moses to experience a different side of him and more of him inside his insisting um, into getting to know God more. And on the mountain, God says, okay, I will put you in the crevice of the rock, I will cover you up, and I will walk in front of you, but you will only be able to see the back of me. And I will say my name is Yahweh. And Moses was allowed to see a glimpse of a new perspective of God, the back of him, to hear him say his own name. And from that moment, he was changed. He, was, he shone so bright that when he went back to the people, they were afraid and they told him to cover up his face. But something that really stood out inside that story is Moses allowed his doubt um, to fuel a deeper dependence and a more intimate relationship to discover more of God, to discover um, to press into that because God told him from before he was born from that chapter that, hey, I will be with you. I will send an angel. I will walk with you. And Moses says, I want more. I want more. So he allowed his doubt to fuel his path and to fuel a deeper relationship. Got to be honest. That's not the route I thought you were going with that. <laughs> but I really liked it better. Thank you. Um, you know, we always, what, do you remember the name of the disciple that is attached to the word doubt? What is it? Thomas. Right, Doubting Thomas. Uh, so my husband, Jared, he says that's one of his um, favorite disciples. And I was like, why is that? And he said, because God met him where he was at. Mm. He, 
God said, okay, if you need to see my, my hands and my feet, here you go. He, he didn't like fault Thomas for it. He gave him what he needed. Uh, and then he said, well, and blessed are those who, who, who do not as well. So it wasn't that Thomas wasn't blessed. So I appreciate that perspective that, that through his doubt, it caused him to seek God more, Moses, and he actually saw more of God. I love that. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm a different example. And if you have a better example, please, I'd love to hear from you. Um, I thought of Abraham. Mm -hmm. So Abraham, I feel like this is a different side of doubt. So we didn't really mention this at the beginning, but I think you can, you can doubt on accident and you can doubt on purpose. And then maybe circumstances cause you to doubt. And I think it matters where your heart is, uh, when you are facing doubt. So Abraham like just was so determined not to doubt. He was literally told to go murder somebody by God. You have to know the voice of God. You have to know the voice of God more than depending on what those words say. A lot of times we base um, what we believe based on like what the words are, but really we have to look at the character of the person saying them to us. We have to listen to the tone of voice. We have to know the sound. So Abraham knew God's voice. So much so that he knew God was asking him to go murder his son. Now, I'm saying that as kind of a, a gut punch because that's really what God was asking him to do. However, it wasn't a very uncommon those days um, to offer your children as a sacrifice. But the point is, Moses could have totally doubted in that moment. Imagine if God asked Moses to do something like that. Um, but Abraham was like, no, I know it's God, God's voice. I'm, I'm just guessing. He refused to doubt, and he said, I'm going to do it. So I feel like that's another side of doubt. Somebody who literally walked with God and said, okay, I know God's voice. I don't care what he says. What he says is true, and that's what I'm going to follow. And I'd like to imitate that in my own life. So down there also on page 111 in Steps to Christ, it says, in order to arrive at the truth that we need to overcome our doubts, we have to have a sincere desire to know the truth and a willingness of heart to obey it. And before this, we were talking about Peter, and I do definitely want you to talk about Peter as well. Okay, well, you chime in too. So um, you know how you have everything ready to go and all of your notes and everything, and then all of a sudden, like, God comes and talks to you, and you're like, oh, wish I had thought of that. <laughs> so last night, as I'm about to go to bed, I thought of Peter. Hello. What was he doing when he doubted? Whoa. <laughs> it has something to do with H2O. He was walking on water. You know, it, that just goes to show that it doesn't matter how high of a mountaintop experience that you were having, you could be on the top of that mountain and you might still experience doubt. So don't feel bad. So Peter is walking on water. And, um, and then I, I was reading this story last night. And, you know, he did ask Jesus, you know, I don't think Jesus was like, come out on the water. Peter said, hey, if it's you, tell me to come out on the water. And so Jesus is like, okay, come. And it was such a faith exercise for Peter to do this in the middle of the storm. He is a fisherman. He knows what happens in storms. I mean, they almost sank a couple of times uh, in the scriptures. But he wa he's walking on water. And then what happens? Everything's Everything's going okay. He's got his eyes on Jesus. And he looks away. And oh, he looks away. Okay, we'll go into that more later. <laughs> <laughs> but he falls into the water. Yes. yes. And he's sinking. And, of course, I love, I love what Jesus does. Because Mark is very intentional about using the word immediately. He uses the word immediately more than any other gospel. Immediately, Jesus reached down and got... Uh, got him. If you've ever walked into our radio station here on campus, you will see a picture, like kind of a blurry picture, because you're underwater and Jesus is above water reaching his hands into you. And I just love this moment because, first of all, Jesus, Jesus immediately answers you when you cry out to him and when you're in trouble. And he never gives us more than we can handle, which sometimes I don't understand what that means when I see some people go through things. And I, I think sometimes in your job, you probably see things and you're just like, but Peter doubted when he looked away from Jesus, when he wasn't focused on Jesus. He looked at the waves. Maybe he looked back at his friends and, were th and was thinking, wow, you know, what are, what are people thinking of me right now? This is awesome. 
But um, Jesus said, where is your faith? Why did you doubt? Does that mean that doubt is the opposite of faith? I don't know. I'd have to hear from you on that one. But is there any hands raised? I can't see. Is there somebody over there? No? Okay. I think that Jesus was encouraging Peter to go deeper. I don't think that he just wanted him to have a surface kind of faith. But I think that experience of doubt was important for Peter to understand that he cannot do it on his own. And neither can we. And the world tells us that we can all the time. We're always, I'm very independent, very self-sufficient, so I don't like dependence, which is why having an infant is so hard for me because I love schedule and routine and all of that's out the door. So holy, totally new faith exercise for me. Was there anything else on Peter that I forgot to touch or that, or that touched you? you? Okay. All right. We're going to go to kind of like the next section. We, we, we both thought this quote was very powerful. I don't know if it's possible to get it a little bit closer up on those two screens, but, um, what is the real real cause of doubt. And I can read that. There are many things apparently difficult or obscure which God will make plain and simple to those who thus seek an understanding of them. But without the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we shall be continually liable to rest the scriptures or to misinterpret them. Next slide. There is much reading of the Bible that is without profit, and in many cases, a positive injury. When the word of God is opened without reverence and without prayer, when the thoughts and affections are not fixed upon God or in harmony with his will, the mind is clouded with doubt, and in the very study of the Bible, skepticism strengthens. So is that quote telling me that if I'm picking up this wonderful book and my heart is not completely open and I don't have taken all my, I haven't taken all my glasses off of um, how I want to see things, then I really shouldn't open this book. I know that that's a really strong statement, but I guess I'm trying to make a strong point that God can't speak to you if you've already decided what you want God to say. I'm going to repeat that. If you're praying and, you're already, and you've already decided what you want to hear, God can't speak to you because he's not going to yell. He's a still, small voice, right? And speaking of that still, small voice, I think so many times God works in the silence, right? We have his word. We have an understanding of who he is. We believe his promises that, yes, his plans are good for us, and he has a plan for us, and he has opened up so many doors. And a lot of his work in our lives is silent. And for human beings who like to see things in an instant, who like to know the process of how things are going, it can be extremely difficult to quiet the voice of the world, to quiet the voice of ourself, to put all of our selfishness and, um, like you said, our own interpretation of what God is saying to us to the side and fully lean in to God's voice, God's stillness, um, God's sincerity, and believe and have that faith that, hey, you said this. Right now, it may be silent. I may feel like I'm here by myself, but I'm not, because in your word, you said that you are with me. Got an example of this. We've been doing the third to fourth grade bridge program with my son, because he's going to be in fourth grade next year. And because he started school a little late, we're just trying to, you know, keep that fresh through the summer, and he gets a worksheet every day. And I'm not always there to hold his hand to help him through all the problems, but he'll say, Mom, I, I, I need your help. And I, and I say, okay, I need you to keep moving because I'm with sister right now, and I can't help you. And so I want you to move on to the next one. It is so hard for him to move, to, to skip over the problem he doesn't understand and keep moving because he doesn't feel complete. And I think often God asks us to keep moving when we don't understand, and it doesn't feel good. But I think in that step of faith, when we're not looking, God solves that problem that's behind us. Um, we should get back to silence. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, this is actually from chapter 11. If you were not here last week, I apologize. I should have said this at the beginning, but it was talking about the privilege of prayer. 
And I found, I, I wanted to read it to kind of see how it fit into what was going on this week. And here's a quote from there. Uh, well, actually, no, I'm sorry. Steps to Christ 108. We're unwilling to wait patiently to see how God will reveal our truth. I think we already kind of went over that. Here's the quote from chapter 11. If we take counsel with our doubts and our fears, or we try to solve everything that we cannot see clearly before we have faith, our perplexities will only increase and deepen. So what does it mean to take counsel with our doubts and our fears, Zoya? That is a great question. (laughs) Um. I think going back to the word, right, when I think of the word counsel, I think of the word counselor. It's someone who is there with you, who is alongside you, who is helping you. And we're going to talk about in a minute, Jesus, when he went back up to heaven, he didn't leave us by ourselves, right? He left us with a counselor. He left us with an advocate. And that advocate is the Holy Spirit who is legit with us, who is in the, from the beginning to, you know, while this book was written and now he allows us to understand and interpret what is inside this book and also what God is saying in our lives, right? Uh, Let's go to the next slide. So just because the the question is, can you, can you ask God questions and express your doubt because we have it without uh, strengthening your doubt? And I think that comes back to, you know, motive, right? So just because we don't get an answer doesn't mean that we won't get healing. That's something that Zoya said to me. We were studying it this week, and I thought it was so powerful, so I wrote it down. Just because we don't get an answer doesn't mean something isn't happening. So um, we both have a short story to share, um, and uh, so I'll let you go first about, you know, it's like you see something, and you're like, how am I not supposed to doubt? So... um I grew up believing that if you ask God a question, like, what's going on, um, it is automatically doubting him, right? And um, last year, I was going through... Um, something very difficult. In my, in my practice, like I said, I'm a counselor. I talk about mental health all the time. I've been a Christian my entire life. And it's when the challenges of life come to you is when everything you have to put into practice. So one of my, um, close friends died by suicide and it was tough because I understand the state of the dead. I understand all of these things, but I still had so many questions, so many concerns, so many things that I was literally keeping away from God because I felt that if I asked him questions, if I pressed into that, if I went to him with the intimate thoughts and concerns of what I was going through in my grief or trying to grieve, I felt like I would be doubting his plan. And a lot of times when we've been Christians for so long, we say these things like, you know, God has a plan and all of which all of that is true. But in those moments of keeping things away from God, that's when our doubt can increase. Um, And it wasn't until my doubt was strengthening by keeping that away because by keeping away those intimate questions it was basically saying God isn't able to meet me where I am God isn't able to answer the tough questions that's in my heart God isn't able to support me or care for me in my moment of grief and in my moment of sadness and just trying to deal with losing someone in such a tragic way And as a counselor, we like to stay away from the questions of why, because often those questions will never meet our expectations. They will never give us exactly what we need. But God is so much more greater. God is so much more powerful, and his ways are so high above our ways. And when I showed him what I was hiding, what I was keeping away from him, he gave me so much peace. He gave me so much comfort, like we talked about earlier, through the Holy Spirit. And he was the one that made it possible for me to grieve, for me to process, for me to receive healing in such difficult moments. And as a counselor who deals with trauma every day, 
that's something that I have to hold on to. Um, that's something that I find purpose in what I do in, knowing that, hey, the why of why this person did this, that's not the goal. The goal is for us to receive healing and to process what has happened, and God is able to do that for us. One of the things that came to mind while she was talking right there is um, how sometimes maybe we use doubt as a protection because we don't really got, want God's answer. We're more comforted in being upset because if somebody can answer our question, that means we have to heal. I've met people who don't want to heal, so they hang on to their doubts and their questions like clothing, like if they don't have them, they're going to be naked. And because they want to be mad. They want to be upset. And again, that goes back to if you're not going to go to the Bible with an open mind and a willingness to heal, then you're not going to. So along that question of why, here's my story. Years and years ago, I had a friend um, who was raped. She was taken advantage of. And um, as, as a result, there was a pregnancy. And that was... It was one of the hardest things I'd ever watched anybody go through. It wasn't fair. I, I was the one, and of course you understand this as a counselor, you, you hear things and um, it's hard to, to understand how God is good when you see things like this. Or when I watched this friend for almost a decade have you know nightmares. Like I was the one staying up at night with her a lot. And you know, this guy is, you know, only in prison for a couple of years, and I just didn't understand that. Now, I share those details only because I know that we all have our own stories and our own details, but sometimes it was during that time where I was asking why, because I didn't see any point in this, and, you know, she was suffering, and he was free, and, um, and she lost the baby as well. So, um, I watched her heal, and here's what she did. I says, what, how, are you, how are you healing? How are you doing this? She said, I can't ask why, because that just brings up too many feelings of justification. So I do believe that God wants us to ask why, but in the right, in the right spirit, in the right way, and then he can handle our doubts and help us to walk through those to get closer to him. Now, it took her over 10 years. It takes some people longer, and some people it takes less. We're able to process those things with the help of the Holy Spirit. So I want to encourage you that whatever is um, wrapped around you and kind of keeping you from, f from fully letting go of, whether it's every things from prejudice to um, doubting that God, like silence, doubting that God's really in this story, I want you to know he is, we have to let go of some things first in order for him to, to start working with us in our doubts. The, the quote that goes along with kind of closing up this before we have our last question, uh, our faith can't, uh, must rest on evidence, not demonstration. You know, the Pharisees always wanted Jesus to demonstrate something. Do some, you know, fireworks for us and we'll believe in you. Those who wish to doubt will have the opportunity, while those who really desire to know the truth are going to find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like you'll always find what you're looking for. Like you hear on the internet, you're like, you know, oh, I read it on the internet. Well, you can find anything on the internet. I don't think that's what this is saying, even though as I read it, I'm kind of like, okay. But if our heart's in the right place, God will speak. So let's move on to our, our, our final kind of wrap-up question. What do we need to do to overcome doubt? Because uh, we all struggle with it, and it's all going to be there. And here's a good point. I don't think it's possible to eliminate doubt. I don't think you're a better Christian when you don't struggle with doubt. Um, I think we're always going to face it. So we, we need to learn how to get, you know, stronger with it. So you want to read that quote? Can you read it? Okay. Yes, it says... Everywhere a wonders beyond our ken. Should we then be surprised to find that in the spiritual world, also there are mysteries that we cannot fathom? And earlier in the book, um, Ellen White says something. She says, 
it's amazing, it, and I'll say it in summary, it's amazing and it's a blessing that we do not fully understand everything that's inside the word of God and that we don't fully understand who God is. Because if we understand everything, God will not be God, right? There is a difference between finite and infinite and there is an amazing blessing that comes from having a book that we can read over and over and over and over and over again and still not fully grasp everything. And I think God is calling us to a deeper relationship where with the light that he has given us, we act and we allow our faith to thrive there. And he will continue to allow us to grow. He will continue to give us more and more um, during our walk, and we have seen this through history, we will get more and more light um, as, as we go on. And that's amazing. And even inside that chapter, she had said, even when we go to heaven, we won't be bored yeah. because continually we will be understanding God. You know, I always thought like, oh, once I get to heaven, I'll be able to answer all my questions. But she says, Every day, we will never get bored because we will continue to explore and understand um, who God is, what he is, and all of the things that he has done. Um, and I think that is a blessing for all of us to know that we are not like God. We will never be like God. We have someone to depend on. We have the Holy Spirit who is walking beside us, who was left who was given to us by God to illuminate and light our path. And through him, we may not be able to, you know, totally cancel out the doubt. It's not about that. Because if we totally cancel out doubt, we don't need the Holy Spirit anymore, right? He ceases to be God. But in that doubt, we can decrease it by allowing our faith to thrive, by looking at God's testimony, by looking at nature, by looking at who he is inside our life. You said earlier that the best testimony is ourselves. The fact that we were able to wake up this morning in our right mind, there are so many things that we take for granted because we don't focus on the little things that we don't focus in the silence and the Holy Spirit allows us to do that to see that God is good to hold on to his word and to decrease our doubt that's right um, and to learn how to face it to get stronger like Moses using his doubts to get closer to Jesus uh, there's something I forgot but I was going to mention that you said I apologize I forget it but I do want to read first Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11 and 10 I know it's backwards but there's a reason no one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit, for his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. So God's thoughts are with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is with us. So our dependence on, that, on, our, on the Holy Spirit should be so much more important than all the things that we think we know. And I think that is key. I think what wraps this all together is that last quote. When the people of God are growing in grace, they will be constantly obtaining a clearer understanding of his word. Now, growing in grace, I will say I believe that's not neglecting to meet together. That could be going to church could be going to Sabbath school, be doing a small group uh, during the week, not neglecting private prayer like we read in the last chapter, saying it's important for us to pray together. But those, those I don't want to say dirty prayers, those prayers where, where you're not thinking about what you're, what you're saying, you can say whatever you want to God in your closet, those create intimacy that allows the Holy Spirit to move in a way that he couldn't. And so I just want to encourage you, to do something with your doubt, go to the Holy Spirit with it and see what God will do and turn it into faith. We could continue, but we are out of time. So let me say a prayer for us. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the Holy Spirit and the way that you used Ellen White in writing Steps to Christ. It's been such a blessing to millions. And today, we've talked a little more about the different kinds of ways that that we doubt. And I am, I am so sorry that I have doubted you. I, I can't imagine what it would feel like if my son doubted I was going to make him breakfast in the morning. But you, 
you provide for us and you are so ready to do everything above and beyond anything we can ask or think and yet we wake up in the morning with spiritual amnesia and we're like, I forgot what you did for me yesterday, I'm sorry. Remind us to be thankful. I think that is going to be a, a big factor in fighting the doubts of the future because I know the enemy is coming for us. It is the end of time. Time is running out, and he knows how to, to get us. And it sounds like doubt causes us to sink. And I just don't want that for anyone here. So I just pray that your Holy Spirit will pour out on us that we can walk above our circumstances because we are growing in grace with your Holy Spirit. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.